All right, how are we doing? We ready? Yeah. Revelation 17. We are almost there. We're getting to the end of Revelation. You can be looking forward to that, but it's getting exciting here in, in Revelation. And, you know, as we continue to progress, of course, last week in chapter 16, we saw the bowls of God's wrath poured out upon the earth. And, you know, that's just not a, that's just not a lighthearted message, right? As we go through the bowls of God's wrath, we can't even really grasp it. We have a good description. John did his best, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to describe to us and explain to us what was happening there in that chapter. But, of course, we can only begin to sort of imagine it, right? I mean, we can't fully comprehend or grasp the magnitude of God's wrath, His righteous judgment being poured out upon a a sinful earth in the last days. Nor do we want to fully understand it. That's one of those things we shouldn't even... Lord. Show me mercy. I don't even want to know it, though I deserve it, right? Though I deserve it and I should know it. I should glory in the fact that, as we just sang, oh, how he loves us. How he loves us that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross for our sins. He was resurrected and in his resurrection defeated death. He ascended into heaven when we can know eternal life and forgiveness through that. And so we don't have to know the wrath of God. We're not appointed for the wrath of God. We can look at this today, and I pray for those who are sort of these, whether you're mid-trib or, my goodness, a post-trib person, to think and to be preparing yourself to have to go through that. I think to myself, my goodness, Lord, I want you to take me out of here, right? And so God's wrath then in chapter 16 culminates. It culminates in what we read in verse 15, behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. And so we see then God's wrath culminating in the battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ's glorious second coming. You see, we have the rapture of the church first. That's not Jesus' second coming. In fact, much of the world will not see him at that time. We believe that he will rapture his church. We will be caught up to meet him in the heavens and be taken to the throne room of heaven, where then the tribulation period will play out, and then his second coming, where all will see and will know, will happen at this time, at the end of this period. And so Jesus proclaims that he's coming as a thief, and then that goes in and we see the seventh bowl. And so it's really the sixth and the seventh bowls of God's wrath that are speaking specifically to the time of Armageddon, where the armies that are on the earth will make their way to the valley of Megiddo, and we'll see nations come together in sort of a confederacy against Jesus Christ. Now, some believe that those armies that are coming together are maybe coming together in somewhat of an overthrow of the government that exists on the earth at that time, and others that it's specifically as a preemptive attack against the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we read in verse 17 through the end of the chapter, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. It is done. And so this is the proclamation then from God the Father within the tabernacle that's there in the throne room of heaven, this place that was shut off. No one could go in. No one could go in and prevent these bowls of wrath from being poured out, and then here this voice comes out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And it's one of those things, as I mentioned last week, it's sort of a bittersweet thing. It's sweet because we know, oh, thank God, truly, thank God that his wrath is complete. But of course, there's going to be the reality of the gravity of the fact that at this point, though we have seen such opportunity for redemption throughout the book of Revelation, that at this point, there is no more. There's no more opportunity for forgiveness. And that's something that for us, for a believer, is foreign, right? As we consider that the nature of God, the characteristic of God, we serve a God of grace and of mercy. I mean, that is what is to us so wonderful about God is this idea that God gives second chances and third and fourth and fifth and sixth. And that is how merciful he is. And it's not that God is now wrong, but this is us now experiencing and seeing that there does come a point when he says, it's done, it's done, it's over. And we know 
It must be. If God's character is consistent, which it is, that he's burdened by this. He's burdened by the fact that he finally has to come to a place where he says, no more, no more. But as we then start to move past that, we can look then to his glorious return. And so as we continue, if you would just pray with me now. Father, again, we turn to your word tonight. Lord, and I pray we'd love it. We'd treasure it, Lord. Lord, may we understand to the best of our ability the power of the word of God. May it be to us, Lord, our greatest treasure. Lord, help us to fall in love with your word, even these difficult parts of it, Lord. As chapter 17 even is challenging, once again, it's difficult, Lord, to understand in many respects. So, Lord, give us understanding of it and give us a, a desire for it, Lord, a passion, a hunger. So, Lord, move here tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says, and it is done. And in verse 18, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. You know, there's earthquakes happening all the time. And is anybody, I mean, listen, pay attention to what's going on in the world right now. Of course, we've got all of the political upheaval and everything associated with that. But I mean, the hurricanes and the devastation that it's bringing and earthquakes down through Central and South America, and then wildfires. If anybody's seen the pictures of the wildfires out in California, I mean, it looks like a, you can't even quite comprehend. It looks, it's like that's in the United States of America. That's happening here. You know, and so you look around and some people would say, well, that's God's judgment. Others would say, well, this is just the product of a fallen world. Others would just say, you know, hey, natural disasters happen. Whatever, whatever camp someone may be in, you have to look at that and you have to say, that needs to get a hold of us, right? That needs to get our attention. Your life is fragile. There's no guarantees. We never know what tomorrow will bring, save what we have in the promises of the Word of God, that if you are saved, a believer in Jesus Christ, you know that no matter what tomorrow brings, you've got a security of an eternity in heaven. You know, I've got a friend of mine who's 39 years old, two weeks ago, in incredible shape, retired from the 101st Airborne Bronze Star, there you go, from his uh, time in Afghanistan, just an incredible guy. I worked with him with my previous employer, and he went out to do an endurance run up in Pennsylvania and dropped dead on the trail. Nobody ever saw it coming. You know, and he's three young kids left behind, and fortunately he knew the Lord, and his family knows the Lord. And even in the midst of this trial, she's seeking the Lord. She's seeking to bring glory to, to our Father. But, you know, he didn't set out on that race thinking that was going to happen. He was ready to spend time with his kids afterwards. They were up in Pennsylvania. You know, and you look at these things, and you look at what's going on around us, and boy, it is my heart. It's my heart to look to the Lord through all of that. Yet we see here that as we continue on now, this is the seventh bowl of wrath that's being poured out. Here there's earthquakes, lightnings, thunderings, such as never occurred before. And it says in verse 19, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and it disrupts the entire topography. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And you know, our Father says that He desires that none should perish, that He does not delight in the death of the wicked. But here we look at this, and I think to myself, I think about the frailty of life, and I think what's going on around us, and it compels, it bends my heart towards Him. But here in this time, as we consider God saying, it's done, I've shut it off, there's no more, no more access to the temple. This is why. Because here, even in the midst of this, it says that men blasphemed God because of the plague. There was no repentance there was no recognition of, God, we're sorry. We're sorry. We were wrong. They blasphemed him. Charles Spurgeon says this, Despite all their suffering, many still will not repent. I've known people to say, Well, if I were afflicted, I might be converted. If I lay sick, I might be saved. Oh, do not think so. Sickness and sorrow of themselves are no helps to salvation. Pain and poverty are not evangelists. Disease and despair are not apostles. Look at the lost in hell. Suffering has affected no good in them. 
He that was filthy here is filthy there. He that was unjust in this life is unjust in the life to come. There is nothing in pain and suffering that by their own natural operation will tend to purification. You know, what this reinforces for us is that it is, in fact, the Spirit that draws one under repentance. You know, some people, they say, well, I found God. Well, you know, that it doesn't work. We don't find God. God finds us. God reveals himself to us. It's the revealing of God. It's the power of his Spirit that allows us, sinful human beings, to be able to see him. And so in the midst sometimes of trials and tribulations and whatever the case may be, and God reveals himself and, and people can see. But this idea that, you know, that somehow just pure suffering and suffering alone will serve to bring one under repentance. And we see here that it often does not. And so this is what we're dealing with at the end of the time is people who in the midst of this are going to blaspheme God. This is the wickedness that remains on the world. And so as we then transition to chapters 17 and 18, what we'll do here as we have throughout the book of Revelation thus far is we sort of dive in a little bit deeper to some of the events then that have already unfolded. What we have in chapters 17 and 18 is greater detail surrounding this idea of Babylon, great Babylon. Now, Babylon, of course, was a literal place. We read about it in Genesis. We read about it a handful of times within the Word. In fact, I think there's six different chapters that address specifically Babylon. Number six, number of man in completion. And so though Babylon is, in fact, or was a literal place, and we still know where the region that was, or Babylon is. Babylon within the word also is indicative of, of something else. It's a symbol of many different things, all of which are of man, of this world. And so in 17 and 18, we'll then dive deeper into what Babylon is. And when Babylon is referred to, like in the end of chapter 16, where it says, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Well, what is that exactly? And so in 17, we'll see the religious system that is Babylon in chapter 17. And then in chapter 18, we'll see Babylon as a economic or financial or commercial system and how that exists within the world, even a bit today, but certainly within the end times. And so these are the last two chapters then before we see the return of Jesus Christ. And so this is the culmination of it all. And here we'll see one of the angels that was pouring out the bowl give John a little bit more insight. He basically says to him, come, let me show you what Babylon is all about. And it gives John an even greater perspective of what's going to happen to the church or the so-called church at this time. Because this is going to be what we'll see here in chapter 17. This is the one world religion. To think that religion is absent from the face of the earth during the last days is not true. In fact, it's kind of interesting that as much as people want freedom from religion today, that in every way, shape, and form, religion has permeated our lives. A belief in something, faith in something. And in the last days, religion will rule the earth. But it will be a false religion. And so we get a better understanding tonight in chapter 17 of what that is exactly. And I don't think, and some of you that have studied Revelation before, and maybe you're familiar with chapter 17, you may be fairly familiar with how many have aligned chapter 17 with the Catholic Church. And so when you see here talk of a woman who rides the beast, you may be familiar with that as being the Catholic Church. That may be your understanding of it. And it's important to note here that it's the apostate church at the last time. Is Catholicism a part of that? Well, it certainly may be. But I would imagine there's a Protestant component to it and a Muslim component to it. It is the ecumenical false apostate church of the day. And so it's not one particular religion or group, but it's an ecumenical group. All religions, if you will, coming together and holding hands and saying, we can get along and we can all believe in the same thing, and that's all great. Babylon itself, then, is known as the cradle of civilization. That area in Iraq and Iran and that whole area now is still known. I mean, that's the cradle of civilization. That's kind of where everybody collectively agrees is the beginning of civilization as we know it. But Babylon, as we think back to its literal beginnings, was known for confusion, right? The Tower of Babel, 
If we look at that within its history in Genesis chapter 11, it says, Genesis 11 verse 1, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And so this is at the beginning when they come together. You see, it doesn't take long at all for man to screw something up. You know, I mean, in here, yes, they were able to build this tower, but the reality is, go back to the very beginning of Genesis. How long did it take for Satan to deceive and for them to believe that they could be like God? And here God does what he needs to, to wipe out wickedness on the earth. And it's only a short period of time in every situation when God demonstrates his grace that man can go back to thinking he can be God all over again. Because here they were going to build a tower to heaven. And so God confuses their language and scatters them abroad. And so we go back to the very beginning and Babel was a place of confusion. It was a place of men's aspirations, men's desires. It's a picture of the earth or the world and it always has been. And what happens here in chapter 17, verse 1, is that, as I mentioned, one of the angels, one of the seven angels, it says, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The angel here, and perhaps, well, we know it's for all of our benefit because it's included within the book of Revelation, but we'll see John sort of marvel at this situation. New King James Version uses that word specifically, that he marvels. And even the angel says, why do you marvel at this? But when I look at that and I read that, I think to myself, because John is looking at this, and just like you or I, we sit here and we read that great hail, 100-pound hail is coming down from heaven, and they blaspheme God? What in the world? Why are they so blind? Why are they so stubborn? What's going on with them? And I think the angel here gives them an understanding. He says, come, let me show you the judgment of Babylon. Let me show you the judgment of this church. Let me show you the way in which the Antichrist has led people astray during this time and essentially justifies the judgment that's coming upon the earth. And so one of these angels comes and it shows John the judgment of the great harlot, as she's referred to. It's almost a sense of here in this culmination that the angel is saying, you want to come see how far gone the people of the world are? What they've followed after, what they believe in, the fornication, the adultery of their hearts. And so this is the religious institution that is a harlot in its day. It's not been faithful to God. And so that's the imagery here is is it says the judgment of the great harlot. This is a prostitute is what's being referred to here, but this is the imagery that's given for the church or the religious system of the day, that they have been adulterous towards God. They've turned away from God. That's what apostasy means, is it's a turning away. This is religious infidelity. The kings of the earth and fornication, spiritual adultery and idolatry. World leaders at this time that are using religion as a means to an end, as a way to control the people. The Antichrist will use an apostate church to control the masses and eventually set himself up as the leader. When the Antichrist first comes to the scene, now think of the seven years tribulation. When he first comes to the scene, the first three and a half years, what's he going to talk about? Peace. Peace, prosperity. He's going to be eloquent. He's going to be most likely very attractive. The right words, drawing people, and there's going to be a sense of, wow, this is the guy. 
And so for the first three and a half years, it's going to all seem great. And in this apostate church, as we'll see, has control over what it would seem is the Antichrist, control over the beast. It seems as if the apostate church is sort of working things out, but the reality is, is come the halfway point, the midway of the tribulation, they're going to realize they got punked. And the Antichrist is then going to set himself up as the true world religion, set himself up as the abomination of desolation within the temple and say, worship me. Not this big religion, worship me. But in order to speak this message of peace and prosperity and get the whole world that exists at that time to come together, he's got to convince everybody that we can all get along. How easy has that been to accomplish over the last several decades? And what consistently divides us? It's not politics. It's rooted in religion. It's rooted in our beliefs that we have at the core of who we are and that we've developed you know, it's less about, you know, what we believe the tax rate should be, though, yes, that comes into play sometimes, but at its deepest levels, it has to do with our morality or lack thereof. It has its ties to religion. It's the issues between the Jews and Israel and the Muslims and the Christians, the Protestants, the Catholics. I mean, this is what's fueling this stuff throughout our world and has been for a long time. And so for the Antichrist to be successful in bringing that all together, he needs an apostate church. He needs a church that's no longer going to be tied to Jesus is the only way, because when the church then is raptured out, there's no more Christians there that are saying, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's not the truth of the gospel. Now, there's going to be some who get saved. There's going to be 144,000 who testify. But towards the latter part of the tribulation, you know, they're out in shelter and hiding Of course, the Antichrist has already set himself up at this point, but there's going to be great persecution that comes against the church. They're going to silence it, and we see, here's the crazy thing, is this is what we see happening already, do we not? We see great apostasy happening already, and that's why it kills me when I see people be so desensitized to it, to see the apostasy that exists within the church today and to not be alarmed by that, but it's a sign of the times. Look at the world today. Look at the church. It says that even at this time, they are drunk with the wine of her fornication. Men, the word says, will be lovers of themselves, will have itching ears, they'll want to be entertained. They'll celebrate their unity is what they'll proclaim, and they'll call it tolerance. You know, but what that basically means is that there's an acceptance of sin There's an absence of any morality. Everything's relative. There's no absolute truth anymore. There's sort of this anything goes mentality that is celebrated as peace and love. This is what is happening, and it gets to its peak, to its height during this time. And that is who this harlot is. It is the religion, the church, the so called church of the day that is really bringing this time for the Antichrist to enter in. And you can go through the word. I mean, read through Jude right before Revelation. You got the letter of Jude. It's very short, but it talks specifically about those who even at that time were coming into the church telling lies. And so in verse 3 then, John here says, so he carried me away, this is the angel, carried him away in the spirit into the wilderness, takes him into the wilderness to see this vision. And he says, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And so it seems that this woman has control over the beast at this time. This is what I was referring to. This woman, this harlot, is the apostate church at this time. And she's got what seems to be control over the beast, which is the Antichrist. If you go back to uh, Revelation chapter 13... You see both the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth, and we talked about how that was Satan rising up, uh, the Antichrist. There was almost this fake trinity, because you had also then the false prophet, the two beasts and the false prophet coming together. And this woman is on top, and it's as if she's sort of controlling this thing or has control over it. And what she is on here, the woman sitting on the scarlet beast, so this is the Antichrist, and this is the Antichrist's establishment. This is his religion, his government. But at this point, she's still in control. The people on the earth there are believing in this apostate religion. And it says that it had seven 
heads and ten horns. And so we see a similar description earlier in chapter 13 of the beast, but we also see this in Daniel chapter 7, right? Daniel 7. It really would have been beneficial, and maybe that's where we go next is to Daniel, because you really have to have Daniel along with Revelation. It gives you greater understanding. But in Daniel, in chapter 7, verse 19... I'll just start in 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth of all of this. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And he goes on to describe this thing. Verse 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom, and another shall rise after them. And so we have what's then transitioning into the 70th week of Daniel, where Daniel gives us a description of this, of the time of the tribulation. And so this is now not prophecy fulfilled. This is prophecy yet to be fulfilled, but it's spoken of and referenced again here now in the vision that John has in Revelation. And what we see here, and we talked about this earlier in Revelation, is that this is then the revival of the Roman Empire. And the Antichrist will rise from this, and then the woman is the false religion of the day. And so the Roman Empire, we believe, will revive again, and we see it here discussed as we continue on. And it says in verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman, verse 6, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So first here, the woman is clothed in luxurious apparel. Purple and scarlet. Purple in particular was a color of royalty, and purple was not a color you could come by very often. In fact, in the book of Acts on Sunday, we'll talk about Lydia, and she was a maker of fine linen and purple. And there's a very tedious process that you need to go through to get something that can dye a fabric purple. I mean, so this is something that speaks of royalty. This is a sign of wealth and power in this apostate religion. And this happens even today. Even within the false gospel today and the apostate religion that exists today is this idea of prosperity, wealth, this name it and claim it philosophy, right? God wants you to have a bigger house and a nicer car. You know, we see this existing within the so-called church today, and it's leading people astray. And so here she's clothed in this luxurious apparel, and she has a golden cup in her hand, a golden cup full of abominations. And so this is a golden cup that entices, this lures people. This is something that, it's this idea that she's going to lure people in. But she's a harlot. She's a harlot. She's an abomination. She'll lead you astray. This false religion will lead you astray. It will entice you with this luxurious appearance, with this cup of gold, and leave you empty and broke. That's the end result. There's no real relationship with a harlot. And that's what she's being referred to here. This is the false church, the apostate church. I think of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Keeps coming up. Great movie. And, you know, this is at the point where he's at Petra. Now, he doesn't call it Petra, but it's this cool place. The rock, you know, and it's Petra. And he goes in and he's got to go through these various things to save his father. He's got to go and he's got to find the Holy Grail, the cup, the cup of Christ. And he works his way in there, and of course you've got the Nazis that are with him the whole time, and they want him to get back there to this place where one of the knights is guarding the grail. And when they get back there, he leads them back there, and they've got to pick. They've got to choose the cup of Christ. Well, the 
guy from Nazi Germany, the Nazi that's there, he says, oh, I'll pick. And what does he pick? Oh, he picks the cup of a king, he says. This gold cup, it's got jewels on it. He says, oh, this, this is the cup of the king. Now, of course, he chooses poorly and he dies in a really dramatic way. Indiana Jones thinks, he's thinking about it. He's like, oh, cup of a carpenter. So he picks the lowliest, the, just the most basic looking cup there. And he says, oh, you chose wisely, right? And so you think about this. This is the apostate church of the age, this gold cup. I mean, there is a sense of, oh, I'm being lured in. I love what I see. And is that not a harlot? Is that not what's been introduced to our culture for so long now? I mean, people here are praising Hugh Hefner, who died last week, because of the liberation that he brought to women through his lifetime. And it's unbelievable to me that the world fails to see the damage that he did, the subjugation of women that he created, and the bondage that he put people into because of it. We're enticed. We're drawn away by our flesh, and that's what the apostate church does. On her forehead is written her name. And this is perhaps an allusion to uh, Roman prostitutes of the day, that they would have worn a, a headband that had their name on it. John would have likely been familiar with that. He would have understood that allusion there. And she's the mother of harlots. She's the representation of the ecumenical movement, this idea to bring people, will entice people and bring them together, and everybody will think, oh, this is great. And she's not just Catholicism. She's all of the apostate religion since Babylon. It says this is the mystery. She is Babylon the Great. And so what does that mean? Is she the city of Babylon? She's the idea. She's the religion of Babylon. If you go back to the beginning in Babylon, what you have there is, at the very onset here, is idolatry. The worship there of Nimrod. That's a terrible... Who'd, who'd, who'd worship Nimrod? That's a terrible name, right? Doesn't sound like a king, but they worshiped him. And Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis also known as Ashtart. These are those who were worshipped within the Babylonian Empire. Listen to this. So Ashtart, or Semiramis, she was the mother of Tammuz. She was impregnated, essentially, as a virgin by a ray of sun, and she birthed, a virgin birth, Tammuz. Does that sound somewhat familiar? So she's supposedly a virgin, and here she gives birth to Tammuz, and people worship Tammuz as a savior. And he was supposedly a mighty hunter, but a hunter who opposed God. Because in the Hebrew, it says that he was a hunter against the Lord. And apparently, on one of his hunting expeditions, he was killed by a wild boar. And he laid there. How long do you suppose he laid there for? Three days. And was resurrected. And people began to celebrate his resurrection. But you know what they did to celebrate his resurrection? They colored eggs. And they began to celebrate each year with colored eggs and the worship of a rabbit, because rabbits were known for their fertility, their productivity, their ability to raise Tammuz from the dead. Does that sound familiar now? Yeah. You know, this stuff starts to go on, and you can find it within multiple cultures. They began to have celebrations of Ashtart, so they changed the name along the way. Ashtart was supposedly born on. December 25th, as was Saturnalia, also supposedly born on December 25th. And so they'd worship this date each year. His birthday, Ashtart's birthday, was celebrated by decorating trees on December 25th, bringing them into your house, decorating them with silver and gold. It was an evergreen tree, which was the symbol of life, accompanied lots of gift-giving and parties. And so you see, you go back to the beginning in Babylon... And, and even all of the major kind of nations that came from that time, and you can see how consistently there was the idea of a savior. There was the belief that there would be a woman, a virgin, who would give birth to a savior. And there were all these different ways in which they celebrated the life of the miracles that happened. And all of these things, you know, sort of started to converge and make their way into religion. How did they make their way into Christianity? How did we adopt some of these things into the church? Well, you know, along the way then, as you're talking about the apostate church and how it's been there from the beginning, the influence of Babylon, along the way you had Constantine, Emperor Constantine. What happened to Constantine before he went into battle? He said he saw a vision. So he saw a vision of the cross and the word conquer. 
And when he went out and he won that battle, he came back and he said, we won the battle because God said we would. God told me we would win. And now Christianity is the official religion. Everybody's Christian. That was a problem for Constantine is he didn't explore that. He didn't seek to have a true faith necessarily. He said, because of this, everybody's going to be a Christian now. But of course, at this time within the Roman Empire, you had so much paganism, you had so many pagan practices that he couldn't go through the process of trying to tell everybody to stop doing this and stop doing that and stop worshiping this. So it just sort of all got squished into the official state religion of Christianity. Right? And so whether it's Saturnalia, who's born on December 25th, and the practices that go along with that, or Ashtar, or Ciceramus, or whether it's Ishtar, or Tammuz, depending on which culture you're looking at, the same practices are there, the same beliefs are there. And so it wasn't, nor should it have been a foreign thing, honestly, for the Jews and the prophecy that's foretold within the Old Testament, and then the coming of Christ, to see what was happening there, to see what was proclaimed. But of course, it was Christ who accomplished it. It was Jesus Christ who was able to fulfill the prophecy, unlike any who had gone before him. But here then you had so much of this stuff, and this goes back to Adam and Eve in the garden, and how quickly they thought they could be like God, to Babylon, and how quickly they could turn away from God and think they could build this tower to heaven. Right? I mean, so this is the stuff that's happening along the way here. This is the vision Now, this woman, this apostate church, this is what it is. It's encapsulating all of the apostasy since the very beginning, and now it's culminating in its very peak. And it says that she was the mother of all harlots, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And so she is the apostate church at the end time, considering all these various pieces. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The apostate Christian church. It's the mother of harlots. It's the ecumenical one world religion. This is what we have here the one world religion, a Christian leader gathering together all religions. And even as it says that she drank the blood of the saints, I mean, think about what happens to those that are martyred during the time of the tribulation. But even if you want to go back through history, like we did with the various practices here, I mean, go back to Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, mid 1500s. 288 Christians just wiped out at that point because they weren't following the the state religion. In two weeks, we'll talk about the Reformation. Why did Martin Luther do what he did? It is sad to see the Lutheran church today. Example of the apostate church. It's ridiculous to see what's happening within the Lutheran church. But you go back to Luther because you recognize that this is not Christianity. This is a state religion. This is no different than Constantine saying, hey, this is what everybody's going to do, and you're going to have to believe this way, and if you get out of line, if you say any of us are wrong, we're going to kill you. You That's not Christianity. So here John's seeing this, and he's sort of grasping and understanding, okay, this image that I'm seeing, this woman on the beast, she's the apostate church that sort of has control of the Antichrist at this time, and it says that he marveled at it. But the angel says then in verse 7, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. He says, why do you marvel at this? Why are you amazed at this? And see, John wasn't amazed. He wasn't like, oh, wow. It was like, he couldn't comprehend what was happening. You know, he had elements of that he would recognize of Rome during the day and and how Rome functioned, but to see and to have an understanding then of what the church was going to become is what he was marveling at. And so this angel says, why do you marvel? And then says, I'll tell you the mystery. The mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was, and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. So the angel totally explained it there, right? Everybody's got it now. We're good. We can pray and go home. (laughs) He says, I'll tell you the mystery. It is a mystery. You know, in some respects, that's why you look at it, it's like, okay, well, how sure am I of all of this? Well, okay, so it starts with here, the woman of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So he says, I'll tell you about this woman, and then this beast that you saw a description of. The beast that you saw was and is not, 
and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Well, we already read that in 13. This is the Antichrist. This is Satan and the Antichrist who was, who came out of the bottomless pit and will go to perdition. And we saw that. We saw that foretold within that chapter. And now it's being reinforced again here that this is the beast. This is Satan that will come out and he will go. He will go into the everlasting lake of fire. The one who was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. At the end of time, at the end of the millennial reign, will ascend out of that pit and will go to perdition forever. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So that's what the beast is, okay? This is the Antichrist, the Antichrist establishment, Satan having control over the Antichrist. This is everything satanic there. The apostate religion is, has control over the Antichrist, or at least what appears to be control for the first three and a half years until the Antichrist says, nope, my turn. That's been enough of worshiping this apostate religion for three and a half years. They now need to worship me. And so he sets himself in the temple. And in verse 9 then, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So further description here. You have the seven heads. The angel says, these are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay, still not clear, angel. Now, this is where a lot of people want to step in and say, okay, this is the Catholic Church. This is why this is a woman that's sort of on top of here, the Catholic Church. That's what the beast is. Now, the reason they say that is because Rome is known as the city on seven hills. That's a distinct difference there. Mountains versus hills. And this isn't like a translation error. The Greek here really says and translates as mountains. Seven mountains, not hills. And so that is a distinction. Now you could still get over that and say, well, okay, hills, mountains, whatever. But the thing is, the apostate church of the age, it can't just be the Catholic church. That's too narrow in its scope. Is Catholicism involved here? Yeah, potentially. But like I said earlier, I think there's Protestantism involved here. There's Muslim. This is the apostate church. This is everybody on earth at the time that decides that we're going to be all ecumenical and we're going to get together and we're going to decide that we can all agree. And so it's better here probably to consider the seven mountains as representing the seven kings and kingdoms described in verse 10. Now, as we consider the Catholic stance here, you know, we do have insight into the involvement of the Catholic Church at this time. The Catholic Review, in fact, at one point put out this comment regarding Pope John Paul II, because John Paul II was going around and trying to just go and connect with everybody and be everybody's buddy, and we see that even still today. He was accused of a ton of ecumenicism. And they put out this. This is the Catholic Review, one of their magazines. The unity of religion promoted by the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, and approved by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is not a goal to be achieved immediately, but a day may come when the love and compassion which both Buddha and Christ preached so eloquently will unite the world in a common effort to save humanity from senseless destruction and lead toward the light in which we all believe. How more ecumenical can you get than that? Right? Am I going to sit here today and say the Dalai Lama is just a violent individual? No. But here you have the Pope saying, eventually we need to figure out how we can all come together to save the world and do so on a common ground in which we all believe. Right? And that's where we start to see this departure. And you can see here that what we're having within Revelation is this time being described. A day will come. When that is what they will believe, when the Antichrist will speak words of peace, suggesting to everyone that this is what's required to avoid eventual destruction. And so it's probably a better view then to not be so focused on the Catholic Church, but apostasy as a whole, and then to look at these mountains as what we see here in verse 10, that there are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Clear? No, me neither. What we see here, and you can go back to Daniel for part of this as well, as he gives the description of the statue. But these kings are kingdoms. It says that five have fallen. Five have fallen. And so at this particular time, John would have known of five world kingdoms that were no more. Egypt, Assyria, 
Babylon, the Medo-Persians, and Greece. Five kingdoms that were no more. One is, and that in John's day would be Rome. Rome was it. Rome was everything at this particular time. And so it says, one is, and the other has not yet come. And the other that has not yet come would refer then to the one world empire that would come. And we believe that that would be a revival of the Roman Empire, or some want to say it's Europe or the European Union and everything that's happening there, however you want to describe it. But that would then be that there is a one world empire, and everybody's still talking about it. You're either, as a believer or a Bible scholar, thinking of it in terms of like this one world government and what it means for the end times, or you're somebody who just believes politically like that that's what's necessary in order for us to survive, that we need a one world government. And we'll start to talk about some of that a little bit more in chapter 18 when we deal with more of the commerce and the economy of Babylon. But this is more about the religion here. So this is the one that is to come. But then it goes on and it says that the beast that was and is not, so referencing back to this beast that we said is the Antichrist, Satan, is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. So what does that mean? Well, remember, the kingdom that is to come is the one world government or the Roman Empire that will rise again in this time. That will be until the midway point of the tribulation, at which the Antichrist, who is number eight, who says, you're going to worship me now, you're going to be under my rule now, who was of the seventh, was part of that whole one world government, was convincing everybody that, hey, I'm in charge of this thing we're leading. All of a sudden, boom, now I'm the eighth. I'm the only one, and I'm establishing myself in the temple, and you will worship me. And if you don't worship me, you will die. You're going to take my mark, and you're going to worship me. And so that then is the eighth that was of the seven and is going to perdition. So it reinforces again here the Antichrist and Satan that will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah? Verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. They receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Alfred, commentator, says this, They are ten kingdoms which shall arise out of the fourth great kingdom there. Ten European powers, which in the last time, in concert with and subjugation to the Antichrist, shall make war against Christ. In the precise number and form here indicated, they have not yet arisen. What changes in Europe may bring them into the required tale and form, it is not for us to say. So we don't know exactly how this is going to come together. Interesting, If you recall from last week in one of the bowls of wrath, remember in the sixth bowl, it says the angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And that was a specific reference to the Euphrates River drying up and basically making a large, if you've seen pictures of the Euphrates, it's a big river, and that if that were a dry riverbed, it makes the perfect road for the kings to come in. And they are coming in specifically to make war with with Christ. And so here we see that they will give their power and authority to the beast, and these will make war with the Lamb. And so now the angel is helping John to see then here that you've got not only the kingdoms that will rise, and the one kingdom that in the very end will arise under the Antichrist, but then the kings who have received no kingdom, and they'll give their power and authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and they'll fight with him. They'll make war with the Lamb but the Lamb will overcome them. You see you see how awesome this is? That all the time, every chapter, there's just encouragement at the end of it of, listen to all this, and this is crazy. And John, no doubt, had to, I mean, he said he marveled at it. He didn't under, he was like, what in the world is going on? And the angel says, I don't know why you marvel at this. You know this is coming. You see it already. You see the apostasy that exists within the church. We see what exists within the church today. We are going to go home, and some of you are going to listen to the news, and you're going to be like, what in the world is going on? And you're going to be so frustrated, you're going to be so concerned, and God's going to speak to you, and he's going to say, hey, what are you worried about? What are you surprised about? 
You know this is happening. I've told you this is happening. Look at your word. Read your Bible. This is what's coming. And he's going to remind us, hey, they're going to make war with me, but I will overcome. I will overcome. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And this is what's awesome here. And those who are with him, guess who that is? Guess who that is? That's right. That's us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that's you right there. You said you wanted to be in the Bible somewhere. There you are. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. (laughs) What a name. What a name. And then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And that's the sobering thing, is that here the apostate church sits on, on many who are left at the end time that will perish. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so this apostate church, midway through the tribulation, they'll recognize, they'll, they'll realize, and they'll destroy it and hand everything over to the Antichrist, that it would be fulfilled, that God's plan and purpose would be fulfilled. And that's a tough one. You know, we end the chapter on that, and it's, you know, we could start to go into that in terms of God's sovereignty and his providence and his election and his choosing and free will versus being chosen and God's sovereignty there. And so that's a tough one to end there simply. Those are the things we have to look at, and we have to say, well, both are there. Both coexist within the Bible, and so we have to trust God's Word. Uh, But we have such encouragement, and that the Lamb here will overcome. And so next week, as we get into chapter 18, we'll see the fall of Babylon the Great, and we'll see more of the economic and commercial component of Babylon during this time, as opposed to the apostate religion. But folks, it's happening around us. You know, you know, I don't want to make claims about different churches out there because I know believers that are in some of these churches, but even Pastor Bobby and I were going back and forth on Sunday just about, you know, when it says men will be lovers of themselves and they'll have itching ears and they'll be desire, right? The way we can translate this is they want to be entertained. And, you know, I saw clips from a church on Sunday where literally it was a service that was being taught by two pastors at the same time, which you could do that. That's, you know, that's fine. But nowhere to be seen was there a Bible there wasn't verse by verse teaching that day. It was topical. And what they spent more time on, and this was what everybody was tweeting out about after church service, was how entertaining the service was because at one point, one of the pastors was tearing something up with a chainsaw, a real chainsaw on stage, had this thing started, was just chopping stuff up. And the other pastor had a blowtorch and was burning things down. And the message was essentially that we're going to break the bonds that the enemy has on us. This is what's leading down that path. And now some others are out there, and they're just way further than that, okay? You got churches out there that, again, apologize for bringing up Jesus during a service, but they're going to tell you that you can have anything on this world that you want, right? And these are the types of things that are just going to continue to snowball and snowball and snowball to get to this place where when the angel says, well, how do you marvel? Why do you marvel? Because even today, there's people who won't stand for truth, who won't say, if you're not teaching this, then I'm out, If I come in here and you don't see me with a Bible in my hand and I got a chainsaw instead and I'm a guy, this is going to be just so much fun today, then you can leave, right? You can say, see ya, right? That's what it should be. We do not want to be an apostate church, right? We need to be right here, right here. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks for your word once again. And as I prayed at the very beginning, Lord, help us to love it, Lord to fall in love with it, to desire it. And Lord, I know that there's times for each of us here, Lord, where we, Lord, we go through a day and we realize we just haven't put in the time and we get distracted or whatever it may be, Lord. And we thank you that there's grace, Lord, but work in us through the power of your spirit, that we would be a body of believers who love the word. Lord, help us to just devour it, Lord, to desire it always. Give us that passion, Lord, we pray. And if it's not there, Lord, then, then do that work in us. Be it ever so painful, Lord, do what you need to do, I pray. So, Father, we thank you for your word, and give us, Lord, excitement as we've studied it here tonight, that that as we look forward to this time, Lord, as, as I've prayed often, as difficult as it may be, Lord, we're reminded consistently that the Lamb, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will overcome, and we are right there by your side. 
And we love you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. Bless each of these here, Lord, as they follow after you and all of our kids, Lord, I can hear outside now, Lord. Bless them. Bless those little hearts, Lord, and work in their lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.